I thought you'd just been attacked by an eagle. Why are you pulling shrapnel out of your arm? It's just a stock animation that represents your character healing himself. What, shouldn't he be putting cream on it or something? You're not getting it. The removal of the shrapnel. It's not logical. It it's video game logical. I love video game logic, that weird disconnect unique to our beloved medium whereby coded realism collides with tried and tested paradigms of design. Examples are more noticeable nowadays as video games reach towards the holy grail of photorealism, their visual language overlapping that of film to the extent where when something so unashamedly video gamey is miraculously healing your yourself after suffering almost certainly fatal injuries occurs, we have to laugh it off and create meme-filled internet threads to nod knowingly at during our lunch break. Because no matter how amazing games look in 2017, they are still, just as they were 30 years ago, representations of reality. Gameplay before realism, an unspoken code of honour every gamer subconsciously absorbs and accepts, our eyes drinking in high-definition hyper-realism, while our brains fill in the logic potholes and allow us to just get on with the game. I, for one, am very grateful. If it weren't for these reality-dodging leaps of convenience, games would be far more irritating to play. Here are seven times video game logic really helped us out, actually. Our first entry is all about video game stealth, something that's almost impossible to pull off completely realistically without making games near unplayable. You have to cut the player some slack in the form of Witcher senses, Eagle Vision, the Soliton Radar, all systems woven into the narrative of their respective games but that are, in reality, just fancy ways of giving you one up on the AI. I used to play a little pretend version of Metal Gear with my sister when we were kids. I'd be all of the guards and she'd be Snake, and to make the game fun I had to sort of pretend I hadn't seen her out the corner of my eye hiding behind the laundry basket. Because in Metal Gear Solid, the guards' eyes don't have corners. They're unmoving tunnels of obliviousness that only register the light from the 15-foot triangle of floor directly in front of them. There is no peripheral vision with these guys, no deviation from their patrol pattern. I mean, look at this chap. Just take another couple of steps forward. Have a look round the corner. It doesn't matter that he doesn't know. What matters is that you feel the thrill of hiding inches from the enemy, of infiltrating the bad guy's lair unseen. Metal Gear Solid's gameplay is a representation of stealth. The brilliance and the excitement comes from the imagined realism conjured in your mind. You feel like a top secret agent. My favourite example of video games helping us out with stealth is in Metal Gear Solid 3, which added survival elements and took away your radar in an attempt to immerse you further into its wonderful game of hide and seek. In Metal Gear Solid 3, you had to change your camouflage to reflect your environment. As you often passed from forest to brick wall to building interior, you'd have to change it often. This works perfectly in game because all you have to do is pop into the menu and press X on the camo you want to change into. Done. Whereas if Metal Gear Solid 3 was like properly realistic about the whole camo changing thing, we'd have a little bit of a problem, wouldn't we? Entry number two was a lovely bit of video game logic often found in JRPGs where you have multiple party members, which is basically all JRPGs. It's easy to have multiple party members in a cutscene or in a battle, but when you're running around dungeons in the world map, where do they go? In the case of Final Fantasy VII, inside cloud trousers. I remember when I saw this for the first time. Barrett, a tough-talking man mounted with a gun for an arm, gives you the lowdown for the opening mission and then just sort of heads towards you. And he keeps coming and coming and... Ugh. 
Where did... It's fine, he's with you. It's just that it would make the screen look all clunky if he was trailing along behind you the entire time. And so you get used to it. Cloud appears at Story Critical Place, party members spill out of his pockets. It's just where the game puts them. The same place it puts Cloud's Buster Sword and his 99 High Potions and his 99 Phoenix Downs and his 99 Tents and his... Yeah, we get it. Interestingly, Final Fantasy VIII, in its quest to be as real as possible, while still featuring a floating skyscraper that summons monsters from the moon, had your active party members follow Squall everywhere, like nervous puppies clinging to their owner as he takes them to the vet for the first time. To be honest, this made me long for the simple days where I could just stuff Barrett, Red 13, Tifa and Kate Sith down my pants and keep them out the way until I needed them in boss fights. Although it did allow me to play my favourite made-up minigame, see if Squall can catch the last person in the party. Like an idiot dog chasing its tail. Come here. Number three. Now, we often feel like heroes in video games, don't we? They cast us as the chosen one, able to take down an entire army's worth of adversaries single-handed. But when you stop and think about it, we often have amazing superpowers, the likes of which our NPC foes can only dream of. And I'm not talking about dragon shouts or lightning-powered melee attacks or swords the size of houses. No, I'm talking about video game protagonists and amazing ability to pause the game, often when the enemy is about to deal as a final blow, and then leisurely scroll through our menu, find some health potions or herbs or whatever it is, and then chug back as many as necessary before unpausing, sailing through what would have been a fatal hit, and then bashing our opponent to death. I mean, imagine if the roles were reversed, you'd be livid! Honestly, this wonderful piece of video game logic that allows you to infinitely pause time while you heal, 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 has saved my bacon so many times I can't even count. Thank you, video game gods. Sorry, really strong bandit who probably should have won the fight. Entry number four is a classic example of the struggle every game goes through when attempting to balance realism with gameplay expediency. If you're playing something like The Witcher 3, which strives for gritty realism within its world of shape-shifting vampires, you want Geralt to feel real, don't you? You want combat to be challenging, you want morally ambiguous plot lines, you want to chat with sweary citizens who live in ramshackle huts built on mud. But the fact you can carry about five swords, various suits of armour and a Holland and Barrett warehouse worth of healing herbs We'll just overlook that. Admittedly, games like The Witcher 3 and Skyrim impose a weight limit on how much you can carry, but really all that does is draw attention to the fact you're merrily riding about the place when really you should be heaving about like I do when trying to carry all the grocery shopping back from the car in one go. And then you get that hilarious situation where you're at the weight limit and you're happily skipping along and then you dare to pick up a piece of paper or something and all of a sudden you're unable to move a muscle. Even more hilarious is that the most effective way to shed the excess weight, in Skyrim at least, is to scoff as much food in your inventory as possible. Because as we all know, food weighs nothing when it's inside your stomach. Another handy trick if you want a heavy piece of armour but your sack is full, is to physically carry it in front of you instead of sticking it in your inventory. It doesn't weigh anything then either. I love you, video game logic. Entry number five. When you're trying to lose your wanted level in GTA and are able to completely bamboozle the police by painting your car a different colour. Okay, suspect fleeing north towards Vinewood Hills is described as male, Caucasian, mid-40s, short dark hair, wearing a blue shirt and blue jeans. Last seen driving a red tailgater, over. Yeah, we've got him. Male, Caucasian, mid-40s, short dark hair, blue shirt and jeans, driving a, uh, uh, he's driving a green tailgater, over. Damn it! Stand down, officer, that's not him. 
our penultimate entry this week happens lots in games like Uncharted and Tomb Raider, games where you fly across the globe, leaping through luscious jungle paradises, swinging over impossible chasms, solving ingenious puzzles, punching nefarious villains, and most importantly, exploring ancient mysterious ruins that no one, I repeat, no one has either seen or been in for hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years. In fact, these are places so secret, so hidden, so shrouded in darkness, that there's every chance you could be the first person to set foot in them, like ever, in the world, ever. Oh look, a health pack! Our final entry this week concerns a certain type of video game character that I'm convinced actually have some kind of mysterious power they're not letting on. You know, I refuse to believe this is actually video game logic despite putting it on this list. There's a conspiracy going on here, and it concerns people who I like to call magic merchants. You know the type, they spring up throughout your game peddling their wares, wares that are always exactly what you need for the bit of game you're about to encounter. This isn't just a case of video games giving a bit of personality to what would otherwise be a soulless item vault. No, these merchants, these merchants are more powerful than anyone can possibly imagine. Resident Evil 4's mysterious stranger crops up everywhere. Those hordes of infected villagers you've had to battle through, you know, the ones blocking all the paths with the monstrous growths coming out of their heads. Yeah, he got past those, no problem. There's something fishy going on with this guy. I mean, obviously, he's masked and got a weird voice, but I'm convinced he must have some sort of magical power. Same as Awaka from Final Fantasy X. In fact, even more so with Awaka. He's just a regular guy in shorts selling things out of a bag. And yet, he manages to appear everywhere. On the Meehan High Road, when everyone is getting ready to battle Sin and the Crusaders have the entire place on lockdown, He's at Lake Macalania, a frigid wasteland populated by ravenous snow wolves. He's in Bevel before you fight Seymour, which is the Final Fantasy X equivalent of sneaking into King's Landing's Red Keep in Game of Thrones. These are areas even our highly leveled party of impractically costumed warriors struggle to battle through. How is Awaka doing this? Through video game logic. That's how Final Fantasy X needs to give us access to certain items at certain times times, deploy Awaka. Thanks, Final Fantasy X, we needed him. So there are seven times video game logic really helped us out, actually. If you can think of any more examples, let us know in the comments. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already for more of these videos every Friday. See you next week.